Good evening. Welcome to Love Talk. This is Gregory Morgan. The purpose of uh, Love Talk is to expand your awareness and to give you more choices and opportunities to grow and develop in your relationships with other human beings. Primarily, your relationship with yourself in your own heart, in your own soul, in your own life. You know, people have a disingenuous or an inauthentic relationship with themselves. We're taught to have that from a very early age. We are taught by our parents and our schools and our religions that our true nature, our authentic nature, our real self should be suppressed and withheld and uh, not shown or expressed and that we should present a false face to the world. Now, nobody says it like that. Nobody says you should present a false face to the world. They say things like, don't say that or you shouldn't tell anybody that. I never want to hear that again. You should know better than that and so forth. So we learn a lot from a lot of different and subtle ways and we also learn from our parents and our and our teachers. We learn from observing mostly other people who they themselves two-faced. They have a public face and a private face. They have who they allow themselves to be or they show themselves as being when they're alone or amongst family or with a few close friends and then they have who they are out in public, who they present themselves as being And so consequently, we end up growing into an environment where the order of the day, the modality of communication, the understanding, the, I call it the meta conversation or the conversation in the background, the conversation that nobody's saying but everybody knows, the conversation that is without words, if you were to put it on loudspeaker and give it words, would be something like this. I won't call you on yours if you don't call me on mine. I won't call you out, expose you as being a phony if you won't expose me as being a phony. Let's be phony together and everybody will get along. And so we present this social face and then strangely, if by the time you're seven or eight years old, if you have not encountered an authentic person, and usually that occurs in the uh, in the form of a teacher or maybe a grandparent or an elder of some kind who has lived past the point where it is necessary, it is no longer necessary to maintain a, a social mask and they've grown into a kind of wisdom, Sometimes you will meet an elder or a teacher or, or, or what the Taoists call a real person, a real human being. And, in, and if you haven't met someone like that by, by, by a certain age, and so you begin to lose sight of who you really are. And so you begin to be this false presentation. And that's who you think you are. And that's who you tell everyone you are. And that's who you would swear that you are. And that's who you will get upset, get in fights about, if anybody exposes or pushes the buttons that are holding that facade, that fake social mask together. So when I talk about having an authentic relationship with yourself before trying to go out and have a relationship with another human being, it's really the most economical thing you could do. It's the best investment that you could make. It is the truest way to live your life if you will come back home to who you really are and begin to disengage from yourself, to throw away or to clean out your house, so to speak. And I'm saying all this because, you know, it is it is the first of the year. It's traditional. It's been around for centuries to do our spring cleaning, to clean out or clear out those things in your life which you no longer need, which no longer serve a higher purpose. You know, you have a lot of things in your life that may serve a lower purpose. Uh, By lower purpose, I mean your survival, your uh, sense of security, your sense of comfort in staying small and, and not expanding yourself, your sense of sloppiness, your sense of carelessness, your sense of hoping that everything will turn out. All of these are are sort of lower needs, if you will. And when I speak of higher needs, I'm not talking about the needs that cause you to survive. I'm talking about those needs that, that one experiences as a human being once your survival needs, your basic needs are fulfilled. So if you're watching this show now, chances are that you have plenty of food, clothing, 
shelter, you've got some friends or family that you belong to and that you feel safe with, and uh, I trust that nobody, you're not worried about any foreign hordes or strange people invading your house and taking you over and, and dragging the women off or taking all your money or killing you, okay? Otherwise, if you're worried about that, you shouldn't be watching television. You should be doing something about that. You should be out uh, preparing for this eventuality. So I'm assuming that if you have the time and energy to, to watch this, even whether you're watching it 10 years from now on video, which is an extreme possibility, wherever you're wa you are, if you're watching this and you're listening, then it's safe to assume that your basic needs are pretty well taken care of and that you're not in a category of people people who are simply just trying to feed themselves and get some clothes on their back and make sure that, you know, they have some more tomorrow, which means that you are compelled. If you're watching a show called Love Talk, then you're compelled to have a higher category of needs. Okay, it's a higher category of needs. They're human needs. They're not animal needs. They're human needs. And the human need to belong. The human need to uh, feel loved and appreciated. The human need to feel that their life made a difference for other human beings. Even if it was just only one other human being, that, to, that your life somehow made a difference in the world and improved the world in some way. A uh, need to give love and to receive love. The, the need to be considered uh, valuable or important, the need to uh, bring, have nobility or, or, or dignity, if you will, to have a, a higher category of, I don't know, class, nobility, appreciation for finer things. All of these are higher human needs. You don't need them. You don't have to have them. You will survive without them. Your life will go along just fine. However, you won't experience certain things like vitality, extreme health and well-being. Uh, you may not experience wealth. Uh, you may not experience adoring or being adored by others. You may not experience uh, uh, the euphoria of love and spiritual connection. Uh, you may not uh, certain experiences that are what I call higher category experiences, higher human needs, but your life will go along just fine. I'm going to assume that that's not the case for you and that you're watching and listening because you care about those things. You, you want to have more vitality, more wealth, more, more, and I don't just mean financial wealth. I mean real wealth, the wealth that you have where you have more than enough of everything that you need and can't wait to share it with others because you're so fulfilled that you're overflowing. You know, uh, your cup overfloweth and that you want to give to others and you have the time and the money and the energy and the and and the will and the and the ability the capability to give and share with others then if that's something that is interesting to you if that's something that calls to you that speaks to you then you're at the right place because that's what love talk is about all of the programs that we do at embrace growth are all about providing you with more freedom and more ability to fulfill those needs uh, those those higher category needs and so that's why we call our company embrace growth and uh, that's what we're all about but I want to talk about with you when you grab on to something that is of a higher vibratory level a higher energetic a more refined level the older things in your life tend to come loose and disintegrate and fall apart that's good you want that that's why we clean out at spring. So let's talk about that a little bit and let's see who we can... Hello, this is Gregory. You are live on the air. Hello. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Morgan. Good afternoon to you as well. How are you? Thank you. Uh, I have a question. Uh, when different parts of conflicts with each other, uh, one part say do this, the other part say not do this, uh, what we should, how we should communicate uh, with different parts of our body and yes i understand them in one route or in one way this is a brilliant question I, I i don't know if you know that so many people do have uh what we call they'll say a part of me wants this but another part of me wants that right yeah exactly yes so let me let me do a little work with you right now okay and I've never d done this without being able to visually see the person, so I won't be able to do the entire process, but this will give you, a point you in the right direction and also answer your question and answer the same question for a lot of people, okay? Now, they say that a problem well stated is a problem half solved. 
So what is the issue as it is standing, as it is in your life right now? Otherwise, we're just talking about theoretical stuff. But there's a specific yeah. thing that had you called. What is it? Different, uh, different. Um, for example, one simple example is that whenever I want to open a book and uh, read a book, another part of my me says that, come on, uh, put it on and watch TV. Okay. Uh, when I, I want to wash uh, the dishes, for example. Yes. One part says that, put it postpone uh, wash it tomorrow or come and watch for example go to youtube or go to internet one of them is a uh, the, the way you've presented the question is like a, a part issue but really it, it sounds like it's more like a procrastination issue parts issue would be like one part of me wants to get married and find uh, uh, the the right man in my life and have a family and the other part of me wants to I don't know sleep around with as many people as I can before I die you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you, you know, the, there might be two parts like that which seem to be totally opposite of each other. Yeah, exactly. Right? But One uh, directs to um, a good thing, the other uh, encourages us to useless or negative. Yes, yeah, I understand. And and so, but in, in your case, it seems more like you... I mean, you need to wash the dishes, right? You, I mean, washing the dishes is something that needs to be done. It's like a necessary task. Somebody's got to do it, right? Okay. And then you have this other voice that says, how about let's go on the Internet and just cruise around and waste some time? Yeah, exactly. Right? Right. How you resolve something like that, okay, is you at, at every moment in your life, there's the things that you're committed to, and then there's your habits or your addictions. You see? I see. And so you could put them on either side like this, right? You could say, ah, this is what I'm committed to. I'm committed to having a clean house or to have having uh, order in my environment and to having an impeccable life uh, to, you know, what, in, in other words, why wash the dishes? Let me ask you that. Why, do, why would you wash the dishes? For what purpose? Yeah, to clean the house. Uh, and my husband, uh, whenever he comes home, and he sees that the dishes are not, the house is not clean, he gets angry. Uh, okay, so t is it to avoid his anger or is it to have a happier life? If I was alone, maybe two days I just won't <laughs> wash the dishes. If you were alone, maybe two days you wouldn't wash the dishes. I understand that. There's times when my wife's out of town for a couple of, uh, a week or something and I wash the dishes when I feel like it. Yeah. Right, but, but I, I eventually do wash the dishes because I value having a clean environment. It's just a value I have. And I value that more than the, the time that I waste doing whatever else I do. You're washing the dishes. If you're washing the dishes just to please your husband, then that's not much of a motivation. Oh, okay. it's, it's not a very high motivation, you see. And I want to say there's two types of phenomenon, okay? There's what we call away from phenomenon. And because human beings are always moving away from pain. We're repulsed by or we're pushing away from painful uh, or negative experiences. And then there is what we call, it. I wish they had a better name for it, but I haven't found one. There's away from phenomena and there is towards phenomena. There is something that we're moving towards okay. in the future, right? Right. So human beings are always subconsciously, whether they realize it or not, our, pro, our, our, our subconscious mind is programmed to move away from pain and towards pleasure. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Problem with move away from phenomena is as soon as the pain stimuli is gone, you're no longer motivated. In other words, you're motivated while, when there's a wolf at the door right? as the, It's a metaphor for, you know, something bad's waiting for you. You move away from that. You're motivated for it. But as soon as that that problem is gone, you're no longer motivated. You're just like, okay. Yeah, exactly. Right? Nothing, right? No no movement, no, no momentum, uh, no motivation. If washing the dishes was going to get you a f paid vacation to Mexico for two weeks, uh, all expenses paid, you would wash those dishes with pleasure, wouldn't you? Yeah. <laughs> you couldn't wait to wash the dishes. Yeah, exactly. You know, if your husband said, I tell you what, if the dishes are done every night when I come home, then at the end of the week, I'm going to take you to Paris and buy you anything you want and whatever, right? Yeah, <laughs> I would if, wash the Man, dishes. those dishes would be clean and put away, right? Right. Right? 
But the best that's going to happen is he's not going to get mad. Very low level, very low level stimuli. You see? Yeah. So it means I'm not motivated enough. Well, yeah, because the future that you're living into, you, the future that you see for yourself out in the future is very short. It's just, it's not very, you know, it's like, okay, he's going to come home in a couple hours. I better get these dishes done so he doesn't get mad. I, in fact, just saying that, I feel disempowered. Mm -hmm. I don't want to do something so somebody else doesn't get mad. Now I feel dominated and manipulated by them. I, I feel as if I have no power when I do something just so somebody won't get mad. I don't do things just so people won't get mad. I do things because I have a higher vision of the outcome. And that, and that includes washing the dishes, okay? Yeah. yeah. What I'm hearing is that you got, you have a no future. What's your future look like to you? Future, sometimes I think that it's better to die because this life doesn't have a good meaning or a good purpose for me. Yeah. So given that future and given that vision of your life, I'd probably just go ahead and shoot myself. <laughs> I'm not recommending that you do. <laughs> I'm, recommending, I'm, I'm recommending that you get a life worth living and you don't have one. You do not have a life worth living. Now, let me tell you something. There's, I know you called just to ask, how do I motivate myself when what I really want to do is do nothing, mm -hmm. right? But it's a much, much deeper question. Most people think that their future, what, when they look out into the future, they see more, better, different, or worse of the same thing they have right now. I don't believe in any future. Well, there I isn't one. That's a good point. There isn't a future. Actually, I don't believe in any past time or future time. Always we live in present time. Yeah, you say that because you read it in some Buddhist book someplace, but you don't live like that. I know because I live like that, and I can tell. I do live in the present time. The only future that exists for me is the one that I'm making up, the one I'm creating, the one that I envision, and then I make it happen. That's my future. I know there's no other future out there. There's a, there's a possible almost likely to happen future but it's not there until i say so now that's a much deeper question than we can delve into here on 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 on, on uh, in a few minute conversation on on television but the future that you see be, and, and how i know is because you say i think it's better if i ended my life because it doesn't hold any meaning for me yeah exactly shame on you because there's no meaning unless you give it meaning, and you just gave it meaning. You gave it the meaning that it's meaningless, and that means something. That means I should, you know, end it. But what if I told you life is meaningless, and it doesn't mean anything? That it doesn't mean anything, it just simply doesn't mean anything. It means whatever you say it means. And you could say it means a wondrous things. Because you have the possibility of having an extraordinary life that makes a difference for people and that brings nobility and love and grace and joy and beauty to life because you have the ability to do that you have the responsibility to do it you have the duty to do it that's why I said shame on you shame on you for bringing this dull heavy awareness to life life has already got that dull heavy awareness that negative vibe who's going to bring something into it that is beautiful and bright and noble and joyous if not you it's your life you've been given the privilege do you have all your fingers and toes and all your body parts do you have a full body that functions yeah do you have some money i don't have money just my husband supports me and okay but you got money then yeah but not enough money nobody has enough money <laughs> i don't care how much money you have everybody always says they don't have enough money but <laughs> I'm just making a joke about that, but a house to live in, you have car, you have food, you have clothing. You got stuff that people would give their right arm to have. Yeah. Right? There are literally millions and millions of people who would die to have your problems. I say that why I should do, uh, I should be hard working. We finally we die. Why sh um, I should work hard or why I should do this or... Why should we finally we die? It doesn't worth hard working or doing something. Let's relax or let's not try. 
something like that came to my, comes to my mind. How's that? How's that working for you? How does that point of view, that philosophy, that that view of life? How's that? that that's not. How's that working for you? Uh, uh, I, I got depression, and now I get two uh, antidepressants. Yeah. Day. Yeah, I'm going to take it that because you watched this show called Love Talk and you were one of thousands of people that are watching the show that called and and, uh, had the courage to call, I'm going to take that as a sign that your spirit, your subconscious mind, has reached out asking for some help and guidance. Now, the only reason anybody ever asks for help and guidance is because they believe that the future could be better. Otherwise, you would not have called. Yeah, uh, yeah, somehow I'm... sometimes I'm hopeless. Yeah, I'm going to tell you what I think you ought to do and you'll either do it or you won't. You need to get involved with a group of people, not just one or two, but a group of positive people who want to uh, have a better life. I suspect that you're hanging around with some people who have a negative point of view like yours or that you spend a lot of time alone and that when you are with other people, you express your negative views to them and they agree with you. Does any of that sound true to you? Yeah, of course. Uh, I don't know why I have very unrealistic expectations from life. I, I always say that. I do too. I have unrealistic expectations from life and guess what? For example, I say that I don't have, I'm, I should have a better husband or I deserve a better husband who shoved me off or... What have you done lately to make him feel like a better man? What have you done for him? For example, he's, uh, he has con- uh, conditional love. For example, he says that when the uh, home Unconditional is not clean, love is a fantasy. And he gets angry and he doesn't uh, love, he doesn't show love for one week. He yeah. has very uh, conditional love. Would, can, you, can you imagine what a joy it must be to be around, with, re, around you every day and to come home to you? Being depressed and thinking that life is meaningless and... And why should we go on because anyhow we're going to die and what should I do? And you're only making the, doing the dishes so that he doesn't get mad at you. And the rest of the time you're on the computer wasting your life. What, what fun would it be to come home to you? But I um, tried uh, cleaning the home. But, um, no, you didn't. Say, you, you, you tried, but you didn't do it. Yeah, I did it. Mm. He, for example, says another justification. He says that, because you don't respect me, that's why I don't... I'm off How could you I respect don't... him? You don't respect yourself. You cannot give to others what you have don't have for yourself. You have no self-respect. You can't respect anybody else. You may act like it. You may say the words. You may pretend, but you don't. And your life proves it. Your life proves that you have no self-respect or that you don't respect anybody else. I know that my self-esteem is low. But... Yeah, I'm not trying to make it lower. I'm just trying to, to, to point out to you but I, I always think that my husband caused that I got. Now I have low self-esteem. Because before marriage, I had high self-esteem. Nothing is your husband's fault. Your whole life is your responsibility, regardless of who's in it. My self-esteem is not relying on my wife or anybody else. In fact, the entire world could hate me, and I might wonder what it is that I was doing to piss them off, but uh, it wouldn't change how I feel about myself. I'm okay with myself. I do what I know is right, regardless of whether anybody likes it or not. And so, therefore, I respect myself. And you don't. And that's why you don't respect yourself. You don't do what you know is right. You don't do what you know is helpful. You don't do what you know would make a difference. You don't do what would benefit others. You're so self-absorbed and self-concerned and uh, uh, egotistical that you think that the world revolves around you and so you you you're, you sit around being sad because it doesn't. You know, you think it ought to, but it doesn't. And then you blame other people because you have low self-esteem. But the only way to have good, high self-respect and self-esteem is to serve others. I'm gonna say that again because most people don't get that. Most people think having high self-esteem means being rich or good looking or, or slim or, Uh, popular or having lots of likes on Facebook or something, you know, has nothing to do with that. Self-esteem is directly an outcome of serving others, of being of service, selflessly, not for yourself, not for the likes, not for the pokes, not for the money, but because that's what you're here to do. You, you, You serve others because that's how you become who you really are. If you really want to know who you really are, serve others. Be of service. Give to others with no expectations. 
and, and, and give what they need, you know, give them what they need and be true to yourself. I mean, I could go on and on and on, but I feel like it's falling on deaf ears. I challenge you to get off of yourself and get over there with your husband and see what he wants and needs to feel like he's important and he's a better man and he will begin to he will begin to want to be around you for one thing but if you're if you're if you're counting on others to have you feel better you you're already lost you're so lost that's why i'm saying do something for others go be of service i don't care go to a church go to a ymca go go you know the best place I know to go to is Embrace Growth Workshops because I tell you what happens over there is that all of this stuff gets cleared up, it comes to the surface, and people get turned on, lit up, alive, and they want to go out and share their joy with other people, which they do, and other people, then they surround themselves with people who are alive and happy and vital and getting better every day at something that they are, they're passionate about, and uh, they fall in love again with their husbands and their wives and their sons and daughters. They fall in love with life. And then this old, depressed, sad, meaningless way of being seems so far in the past. They look and they couldn't believe that they were ever that way before. You show them a picture of what they looked like before they came to the workshop and they're like, I can't even believe it. Most of them lose weight. They start gaining, uh, making more money. Uh, they get married. Uh, if they're in bad relationships, they get divorced. Uh, they, they, they move on with their life and, and heal themselves and heal others, and they make a difference. And, they, and, and they're so excited about it that I can tell you, you know, we have WhatsApp and all these different uh, uh, Viber and Messenger and all these things that uh, today you can stay connected to people 24 hours a day around the clock and around the world, 37 different cities uh, around the world, there are thousands of uh, Embrace Growth graduates who are in uh, interacting with each other. They're up to projects together. They're sharing together. They're coaching each other. They're, uh, if one of them goes down, you know, there's 20 people, uh, you know, there to support them. You know, they're meeting the challenges of their lives in a way that brings more and more growth and development and self-awareness and joy and vitality to their lives. I couldn't think of a better place to be. Uh, so I'm, you know, I'm highly recommending that if, if you don't want to do an Embrace Growth Workshop, do some other seminar or workshop, but get out of that funky place that you're in and uh, and begin to make a difference with other people in your life, okay? And stop procrastinating about it. Hello, this is Gregory. You're live on the air. I was a nurse for uh, maybe 19, 20 years. And Congratulations. I inherited my hands almost uh, two years ago, and... Uh, I'm not able to do the same thing working, uh, I'm not able to work in a, on a field because I got a um, disc on my neck. So, anyways, um, I, um, and I do not want to do anything else or I don't have that much knowledge to work on, on a computer and also, and people they are telling me, yeah, you go learn and, you know, and uh, I did go, but I couldn't concentrate. I don't know what's wrong with me and why. How old are you? I'm 57. You're 57. You were a nurse for 18 years, did you say? 19 to 20 years. 19 to 20 years. And you, what, you hurt your hand and you hurt your neck. Is that true? Uh, it's from neck to my hand, yes, both, yeah. I mean, like, uh, I'm, I'm not able to... Uh, more than five, ten pounds. As somebody who's been injured a lot, okay, as a martial artist, a dancer, and a motorcycle rider, and somebody who also did a little rodeo, I've been banged up. I know one thing, and that is that the body can heal itself. So unless you've gotten some very severe injury, uh, whatever it is you've got is repairable. The body naturally heals itself when given an opportunity to do so. So did you destroy a disc or something? It's a bulging disc. Is it on okay. C7, it's a 3 millimeter bulging disc. And I, I'm not, I don't have any pain, but I'm not able to carry, like, to my nursing bag. Yeah. I used to go to the home to homes and... You know, with the patients, and I'm not able to do that. I'm not able to. Well, it, now is is uh, I understand that nursing is what you did throughout most of your adult life. However, it may not be appropriate for you now. Okay, 
And so there's lots of other things that you could do, and I'm sure you have some very specialized knowledge and you could make a lot of difference with a lot of people still. Uh, I'm assuming if you became a nurse, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that you like to help people. Is that why you became a nurse? Yes. Or, I or did so you become a nurse me. because it had That's good pay? That's why and... I tried to do that. I was enjoying it. I mean, some people become a nurse because they couldn't become a doctor. You know what I mean? Some people become a nurse because, uh, I don't know, it pays well or something. But uh, I, I would think that there were some... There's other things you could do that would make the same amount of money. So yeah, is, first I became a nurse because uh, I was a single mother, so I had to survive. So that's why I did. I don't know what was my tension that time. I remember when I went to my clinical, I was so sick to my stomach, but for the first six months, but then became habit, and then I was enjoying it. Okay, so that's no longer available to you. And the first thing I'm questioning is if that's actually true, based on what I already know about having healed myself a number of times in my life over uh, more injuries than most people will ever have. My doctor tells me even at, I'm going to be 65 this year, I could still pass any military physical. So I, I don't know if that's true, but <laughs> he may just be uh, stroking me. But <laughs> I feel pretty good. And I have, uh, uh, so I know that you can you can heal yourself, and I know that uh, given proper care, that that most injuries can heal themselves, uh, including bulging discs, which I've had two of them, and now I don't. You know, I strengthened the muscles around them, and I saw a chiropractor who was smart enough to show me how to to uh, work around that until I was able to actually repair. A bulging disc. Now, okay. And there, and there, I know that there are tons of doctors who will say you can't do that. That's not possible. I've also repaired a torn medial meniscus in my knee. They said it was impossible to do, and that you couldn't. Uh, you know that you. I would have to have surgery. I would never walk without a limp. You know, all of that has been done. You know, and I. Oh, okay. I, so I. So have don't tell me you got a bulging disc and you can't move on with your life. Because I'm, you're talking to the wrong guy. I'm telling you that that's not true. You can heal that. So I'm hearing from you. Um, I, I was thinking about the chiropractic, but I was, mm -hmm. it and uh, so I'm gonna do that. I'm not able to do this on the air, but if you uh, uh, are interested, I can. Uh, are you in California by any chance? I'm in Los Angeles. Call my office, and if you're interested, I will refer you to a guy. He's the only guy I've been seeing for 27 years. He has uh, He's the guy I'm telling you about. Not everybody can do. In fact, nobody I know can do what this guy does. So I will do that. Thank you so much, Mr. Yeah. Morgan. This can be handled, okay? If, if that's all that's stopping you is that injury, that actually can get healed. The, the deeper question is, sometimes, and this is... Uh, something that you might want to look at too whether or not you heal these discs sometimes your body tells you it's time to move on like i said i was a martial arts teacher i was a i was a modern dancer i did a lot of things at, at some point my body said time to move on i was a carpenter i used to climb on scaffolds and ladders and carry heavy tools and lift stuff over my head all day you know at one point my body said it's time to move on so it may be at 57 it's time for you to to use your heart and your mind to help other people to heal rather than just your hands and your feet and your back that's true i began to see that there are different levels of supporting oneself and one of them requires having your physical body engaged. In other words, you're making money with your body, whether you're a masseuse or a, a piano player. You have to physically be there to make money. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just that if you've got to move your body around and do stuff with it in order to make a living, that's one level of making a living. There's other, other levels of making a living where your body is less involved, where you're, say, teaching, right? You, know, you may have to show up and go to work, but you're not lifting things and putting stuff around, right? Moving material objects around. You're moving people's soul. You're moving people's minds. You're, 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 you're sharing your knowledge. Uh, you're creating something. Various artists are able to create without having to get their body so intensely involved. So ideas, in other words, you could teach and share ideas that, that, that make a difference for people. And then, you know, there are business people who simply make phone call and make a bunch of money, right? <laughs> 
who put deals together. It benefits everybody concerned and they make some money too. There's lots of ways of earning a living that don't require having uh, your body, you know, at 57, moving things around. And so I just point you in that direction and maybe your body is trying to say, hey, enough of that, <laughs> you know, and uh, pointing you at, at giving you the opportunity to uh, to make a difference and to make a living in some other way. So cons- That's true. consider that. Consider that and, and meditate on that a little bit and see if uh, so see what comes up. Hey, thank you so much, yeah. Mr. Morgan. Have yes. a wonderful day. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Good day. Great. So, uh, wow. Thank you for uh, watching. Thank you for calling. Um, As we complete the old year, we complete the year past and begin to create a future, in other words, creating the next year, it's important to follow a few steps and people have been doing this rightly and wrongly over the centuries. And uh, so I want to point you in some directions that I know work. One of them is uh, something that you already know, and that is to gather together the things that you haven't used this year that are no longer serving you. Uh, A lot of people uh, have a rule, for example, if if I have a pair of shoes and I haven't worn them all year, those shoes need to go to somebody else now, or a a coat or a jacket or clothing or objects around your house. Uh, You have things that are in storage. You have things that you're saving for another day. I had actually rented storage units to store stuff for years thinking that one day when I um, buy a bigger house or a nicer house, I would use those things in that house. The truth is that in order to get that other house, that that bigger house, I had to get rid of all those things. I had to get rid of all those things first. And as soon as I did, then a better, uh, nicer uh, house uh, came about. And then when we moved to that house, I didn't need any of those things. I have missed one of them. I can't even remember what it was I was storing for all those years and paying all that money to store. So sometimes you just need to get rid of stuff so that the future could show up. You see, there is a, a, a future that wants to happen. There is a light that wants to happen. There is a natural flow of things in the universe. And so whether you believe in God or not, I hope you believe in the universe because you live in it. It would be pretty ridiculous to not (laughs) believe in the life that you're currently living in a universe. The universe has a way it is going. It has a way that it is evolving. It is an expanding universe. I say that it is a loving universe. It is a positive and good universe that is motivated by good intentions. It does not mean that there is not explosions and destruction and all those things which appear to be negative, but in fact are clearing and making the way for new life. You know, the French say you can't make an omelet without breaking some eggs. You can't create a new life without breaking up the old life that you already have. In Embrace Growth, I'm teaching people to constantly be letting go. You see, if you were constantly letting go of what was not necessary, what was not uh, serving you, what was not enlivening you, if, if you were looking at your life, if you look at your life, when I look at this object or this thing, does it make me feel positive or do I feel kind of drained by it? Do I feel like, eh, like I'm putting up with it? Every object, every person, every thing, every circumstance in your life is at all times, in all circumstances, either enlivening you and causing a good feeling, a positive feedback when you see it or feel it or hear it uh, or smell it, that or a negative one, one that you, you that, that brings you down, that you have to deal with, that you have to put up with, that you that darkens your vision of life. I'm a saying from my experience in life. I'm here to tell you that there is that the universe is abundant. And if you don't believe me, look at all the stars. Look at all the people. Look at all the blades of grass. Look at all the water. Look at life itself. Life is overwhelmingly abundant. And there's an overwhelming amount of goodness in life. Then there's some neg- there's what appears to be some negativity going on. And so I say appears to be. I say that those things that appear to be negative are self-destructing all the time anyhow. They're disintegrating, disintegrate. Integrity means to integrate. Disintegrate means to lose integrity, to, to, dis- in- to come apart. Life is constantly growing and dying, growing and dying, growing and dying. Look at a plant. Look at your life. Right now, as you sit there, 
there are billions of cells in you that are dying while and making way for brand new billions of cells to to be born and so that every seven years every cell every molecule in your body has renewed itself so you, you're constantly living dying okay you've been since from the moment you're born you've been dying and growing at the same time so if if you attach yourself to the negative and go like um, like the previous caller well why live life because you die anyhow that's an absurd commitment to avoid the responsibility of living a powerful life. If you want to live a powerful life, you will be uncomfortable sometimes. And so if, 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 if your comfort is all that matters, if your comfort is the most important thing, if, if being safe, if being warm and being you know protected and shielded is your most important thing, then you're living a very low level life. It's a, it's a level of survival. There's no happiness there. Survival is not amount is supposed to make you happy. Survival is just about keeping your heart beating and your lungs breathing and you know you keep waking up and going to sleep and going to the bathroom and eating food and it's just a biochemical reaction. It has no meaning whatsoever. As I said in the earlier part of the show, the higher meaning of life, the the human meaning of life, once your animal needs are taken care of, that takes moving out of your comfort zone moving towards not moving away from pain you will not if you move towards pleasure doesn't it make sense that you will naturally move away from pain if you move towards what is the greatest al aliveness and the greatest good for all concerned it is it outranks happiness ha <laughs> unhappiness happiness outranks well-being and vitality and aliveness outranks deadness it's a higher category of enlightenment. It's a higher category of being alive. So if you're moving towards that, it is natural and necessary, natural and necessary, that parts of your life will disintegrate, fall apart, become disordered or disintegrated as you move towards a higher vibration, as you move towards a more, a more refined, vital, and, and, and uh, resourceful life the unresourceful, restraining the dead part of your life will begin to fall apart. That's why some marriages fall apart whenever people go to workshops or go to therapy or do something and all of a sudden they wake up and they go, wow, I want more life. And then the other one goes, I liked you better when you were dead because I could manipulate you and control you and make you feel guilty. And now I can't do that. And so they fight <laughs> and because one is fighting for life and the other one's fighting for keeping things dead the way they used to be. And so very often they will either move apart and hopefully you know our highest desire and embrace growth is that they will move together towards a higher category of life towards more love and, and togetherness and and making a difference and when they get up out of their depressing way of life it's only natural to keep moving towards pleasure if every time you made an effort you got a pleasurable outcome you got a positive outcome and, you know, let's say you made 10 efforts and got nine positive outcomes and one negative one. Would you let that stop you? Heck no. You would go, you would keep going. I'm not saying, you know, somehow magically if people do our therapy or if they do our workshops or they uh, participate in our Embrace Growth thing, I'm not saying that nothing negative or bad will ever happen to you. That's ridiculous. I would never make such a promise. I'm saying your ability to deal with it will be so exponentially expanded so increased that what used to be look like an overwhelming threatening circumstance what used to be like oh my god my life is over would be like a bump in the road it'd be like eh, you know no big deal or a challenge that will have you look deeper and discover even more resources within that you didn't even know you had and those hidden resources those treasures that are within you and that you don't even know you have for the most part you may suspect that you have you may remember when you were a child you had but you've forgotten a long time ago those hidden resources will rise to the top and answer these challenges so I think that the challenges that you have in life are so that you could discover those if there was a greater art, a greater meaning to life, if life had an intelligent, loving, positive meaning, 
And remember, we already said earlier in life, earlier in the show, life doesn't necessarily have any meaning except the meaning you give it. So I'm pointing at something right now. And what I'm pointing at is that you give the meaning to life. And if you gave your life, because that's the only life you can give meaning to, (laughs) is if you gave your life a meaning of moving towards the greatest good for all concerned, the most loving, satisfying, self-fulfilling, vital, alive outcome that would have the greatest effect and leave the greatest trail, if you will. Uh, you know, before I, uh, I I had this transformational experiences, I had a trail of, you know, brokenhearted people or angry people or people who were disappointed in me. I left a trail of people in my life who were uh, not very happy that I'd walked through their life sometime. Now, not everybody. I don't want to paint myself as some horrible person. But like most of you, there were people who were kind of disappointed in me and who were angry at me or who had been hurt by me. And I had arrived at a place in my life where I felt that I didn't deserve to be loved, that I didn't respect myself, I didn't love myself. And I had, you know, I won't talk you through my whole evolution, but I mean, I had a transformational experience and then a number of them ever since. And I continue to have transformational experiences in which I see the greater meaning of my life and and it blows my mind. It's just, I, I see the opportunity to make a difference, to leave a trail of love, to leave a trail, to leave a legacy, to leave a path behind me instead of littered with the junk of my life, crowded with people having a wonderful life. And uh, some of them may not even have known that I had anything to do with it. I now have the pleasure and the honor of, of leaving a, a legacy of love for future generations. In the doing of this, many of the aspects of my life, many friends, many of the uh, career things that I thought I might want to do, you know, I, I, was a, I was a dancer, I was a martial artist, I was an actor, I've, I've done things that, that I thought, that's my future. I, I believed at the time that those were the things that I would be doing for the rest of my life, and I imagined I fancied myself as uh, as being a, a a well-known actor or to be a a martial arts teacher or you know many many things that I've done. I've done a number of things uh, that I did very very well. You know, at each turn of the way, thought, well, this is this is my future. This is my life. Only to discover that something else opened up and something else opened up and something else opened up. You have. Have no idea just like I didn't of what's available to you what is going to open up for you in the future if you live your life 100% to the fullest right now so I mentioned all these different careers that I had but each one I did it like this is the only thing I will do for the rest of my life and I'm going to absolutely master this I'm going to be the best there ever was I'm going to at least be the best I can possibly be at this so I applied myself a thousand percent to become the best I could possibly be at whatever it was that I was undertaking at that time. I did it not so somebody wouldn't get mad at me. I didn't do it to move away from pain. I didn't do it to avoid anything. I did it because it called to me. It, it called to me like a future. So I, I'm, when I look back on the latter years of my life, the last 20, 30, 40 years of my life, not the first 20, but the last... 35 to 40 years of my life, I was constantly letting go of of the past and moving towards the future. That's an easy way to say it. We've already said there's no past and there's no future. Moving away from those things that held me attached to a certain way of being that I had learned where? In the past. As I let go of those ways of being, this is what I mean really when I say letting go of the past. Some of the people came loose. Some of the lifestyles let go. Uh, some of the places that I lived changed radically. I've changed languages. <laughs> I've changed careers because something was calling me to move forward. And so as I, I propose to you that you don't wait around for something to call you, that you cause it, that you make what happened next be an expression of your truest heart an expression of the love and the nobility and the compassion that is within you. And I know that it is, because if it wasn't, you would have been bored a long time ago and already changed the channel. There must be something that speaks to you in what I'm saying. And and so I'm speaking to that part of you, your heart, that wants the greatest good for all concerned. You want the greatest good for yourself, for your family, for the people that you love, for the people that love you. Whether you're 
present to, whether you're consciously aware of that at this moment or not, if you look within your heart, I'm sure that you will find that this is true. What is it that you could do that would best serve them? Go and do it. Find out what they need and go do it. Get your attention off of yourself and put it where it will make the most difference with other people. And then who you really are can rise up. It's not about digging down and gazing into your navel and trying to see who you are. You're not in there. There's nothing in there. There's blood and guts and lungs and organs and bones and stuff. There's nothing in there. If we cut you open, we're not going to see any spirit in there. We're not going to see any soul. We're not going to see any true you in there. Who you are is out there. It's reflected back to you in the eyes and the words and the lives of the people that you've touched. How you know who you are is the, by looking at the results. You live in the house that you live in as a reflection of who you really are. You drive the car you have. You have the career that you have. You have the clothes that you have. You have the body that you have. All as a result, a reflection back to you of who you're being on the inside. If you want to know who you are, look out there and see what's being reflected back to you. Are you surrounded by happy, loving, joyful people that want to give? Are you surrounded by stingy, ugly, mean people that want to take away? If so, both in both cases, that's you. That's what's inside you being reflected back to you. If you want to have a pristine life that has health and vitality, clean out your closet, clean out your glove compartment, clean out your dirty junk drawer, sweep the floor, wash the dishes, clean the windows, do the laundry, make your environment beautiful, and then share it with people. Make some wonderful food and give it to people. Do something that makes a difference for people. On a simple level, I'm just mentioning things that anybody could do. Anybody can do those things I just said. That's like the basic things. And how you know you love yourself, how you know you have self-esteem, is by the commitments that you're willing to make and keep. At every point in your life, you're either living by your commitments, that you're making commitments and keeping those commitments, or you're living by your addictions and your compulsions and your biochemical reactions In other words, you're either living as a human being or as a basic human animal. And so it's your choice. It's your life. If we gave you a magnificent brand new car and you just drove it into the ditch or left it parked in the garage or left it to rust or gave it away, that's your business. You have a right to do that. However, if we gave you a beautiful car and you polished it and took care of it and used it to make a difference, that would be a whole nother life, wouldn't it? So you've been given a life. You've been given an opportunity to make a difference in life. Either do it or stop complaining about it. This is Gregory Morgan. You've been listening to Love Talk. Thank you for watching. It's an honor and a pleasure. And I'll see you back here again next week on Love Talk.